थोड़ा उधर बंद करो बोला थोड़ा बंद करो I now invite Dr. Raini Hassan, founder and president of Board of Genetic Council in India, to give the keynote address. I would start by thanking Anum for inviting me here and also indicate to the audience that she has given me 15 minutes to talk about pharmacogenomics overall. So, my professor, Vayara Abuja, used to say that if you know your subject, you should, you should be able to give a capsule form. So, the word capsule works out very well for today's talk. Personalized medicine based on pharmacogenomics. I know that uh, the audience is varied, so I've kept it very simple and we leave everything else to the panel discussion. Next slide, please. See, we all are aware that we don't give the same drug or the same dose to a child, an old person, a pregnant woman, and so on. So we know that medicine needs to be personalized. But then we need to personalize it to every individual. The same different children may not be responding to the same drug or the same dose. So it's not just that a pediatric dose or a geriatric dose is required. So what makes us unique is the thing which makes us respond specifically to specific drugs or get adverse reactions. Next slide. The first gene which people knew which had a variation and caused a problem only when a drug was given was G6PD. G6PD is an enzyme which keeps the stability of the red blood cells and a person can lead a totally normal life if they don't encounter certain drugs. And the commonest one is the malaria drug. So if they take that drug, only then there is a red blood cell damage and hemolytic crisis. So many countries, many countries look at G6PD deficiency at in the newborn screening period. And when you know it, you are well informed and you do not take those drugs, you avoid them. Next slide. This is personalized medicine has become very acceptable in cancer. Sir is sitting here in ongoing targeted therapy. But again, in blood cancer, if there is a chromosome 922 translocation, the person will respond only to Gleevec and not any other hydroxyurea and the multiple oncogenic drugs available. Next slide. This is something Chandak should look at, MTHFR, because Chandak has done a lot of work on MTHFR, and he knows it, and he has been informing clinicians that every woman in the antenatal period does not require folic acid but some definitely require it much more than others. Folic acid, B6, B12, looking at the whole folate metabolism and various genes in the pathway. I've just represented one year, MTHFR. Now this variant protects, if you have a variant, then you should be given a B6, B12 and folic acid, not only in the antenatal period to prevent neural tube defects, but also to prevent young age strokes and MIs. Next slide. Transplant. I was just talking to clinical pharmacology students and worker, people working in this industry, that whenever we do a transplant, 
without giving a immunosuppressant, that transplant doesn't survive. And now, if you know that you are giving cyclosporin or tacrolimus, then you know, need to know which are the genes which an individual has so that you monitor the dose. Currently, how the dose is monitored is, after the transplant is done, you keep monitoring the levels of tacrolimus and changing the dose. But if you do it prior to transplant, you can plan your therapy. Next slide. So now, I've given you examples from different fields telling you why individualized and personalized medicine is required. Every drug we take in needs to be absorbed, goes to the liver, gets metabolized, acts on the target organ. Like if you take a aspirin, you are taking it by the oral route, but it's acting for your pain in the head. So it has to work on the target organ, <coughs> then it needs to be excreted. If it doesn't get excreted, then you get adverse reactions much later than immediate adverse reactions, which are seen, seen and documented as an anaphylactic reaction. So for each of these steps, that is absorption, metabolism, and excretion, there are genes. And these genes vary in all of us. And that is why our dose has to be catered and personalized to get the best outcome. Next slide, please. Now, CYP2D6 is one of those genes which metabolizes. And this gene is very close to my heart because this was the gene which got me into pharmacogenomics. My son got injured while he was in USA playing cricket. He hit his lip with the ball and naturally, you know, as a mother, as a lay person, what do you do? You do put the ice pack, you give them some medicine for pain relief, brufane, paracetamol, whichever I had carried with me. And then an oral surgery appointment was given. 48 hours later, oral surgery done, medicines given to him. In the next 24 hours, my son had severe stomach cramps and he went into hallucinations. And when I went back to the surgeon, the surgeon told me clearly that I am an oral surgeon, I have done my job beautifully, there is nothing wrong, please go back to some other emergency. Maybe you need an MRI, maybe he has a head injury. I said, what is this head injury? They were playing cricket, I was taking a video, I saw the ball hit to the face, there is no head injury. Anyway, we stopped the medicine which they were giving and just gave him sips of water so that he excreted it out and he was fine in 24 hours. I knew then, I don't know how many of you know, but in USA they never give you the name of the drug. They give you a bottle with the name of the patient on it and saying, take these drugs twice a day with food till finished. So I didn't know what was there. But being a geneticist, I thought this must be CY2D6 ultra metabolizer. And the drug they have given him was Tynalol, which was paracetamol plus codeine. So what happens is codeine gets converted to morphine by the gene CYP2D6. And this morphine acts as on the opioid receptors to give you pain relief. But individuals like my son, who have a duplication in CYP2D6, are ultra metabolizers. So codeine gets into morphine and he went into morphine toxicity. So we came back and I got the test done in India. And he was CYP2D6. So that's why now you may have read that many countries, including India, have banned cough syrups which contain codeine because they say they are addictive. It's not addictive for everybody. It's addictive only for people where there is high conversion from codeine to morphine and they get into that. They get that euphoria which they get from morphine. And my son was asking, is it a good idea that you give me codeine and take my blood sample and that would be morphine for others? I said, let's not try that. Okay. So, so you see how one thing which is 
Now, next, I did the same test for myself and my husband. My husband was very reluctant. He said, no, 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 I've never had such a thing before. I said, you have never, never had such a thing before. I said, you have never had, because you were not exposed to that particular drug. So that's what pharmacogenomics is. That unless you are exposed to the drug, everybody is normal. Next slide. So now, this is what the test we are launching here today, that every drug, you need to do a DNA test based on the pathway. So you can do two types of tests. One is companion diagnostics, like if you are giving clopidogrel or warfarin or proton pump inhibitors or uh, drugs for renal transplant. Inhibitors. There we do one or two genes which are playing a role in the metabolism of that drug. That's called companion diagnosis. The other is you do a panel of genes so that you are prepared for any drug which you are going to encounter. So both tests are available. But the idea is that if you do the pharmacogenomic test or the DNA, then you know that an individual requires that drug in that particular dose which is recommended or requires half the dose, double the dose or you have to give an alternative. So you personalize, the doctor personalizes the treatment based on the DNA report. Now, I'm, sir you are here, I am miss telling that CYP2D6 is not just for codeine. It is one of the important things for breast cancer, the tamoxifen treatment. Poor metabolizers of CYP2D6 do not benefit from tamoxifen. And that's the drug which we use most often. And especially, I was looking forward for the minister to be here because Aru usually covers tamoxifen and doesn't cover other things. Next slide. So if we take hypertension, maybe 20% of our population has hypertension. And what are the drugs available? Our pharmacology colleagues will say we have a whole list of drugs. We have beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, ACE receptors. Now which drug suits whom? A clinician gives it based on their experience. They have given it to 20 people, the 20 people responded well, but the 21st may not respond well. And that is where the pharmacogenomics comes. So if the patient group is same, with the same diagnosis, and you are giving the same treatment, some may respond to it brilliantly, some may not respond but are taking it, so you are adding another drug, some it becomes toxic, and in others, it may be toxic but beneficial because it may not be excreted out. So you may see the side effects much later. And any long-term therapy, whether it is hypertension, whether it's diabetes, whether it is stroke, or whether we are doing a CADG and following it up, or doing a stent, uh, uh, brain surgery and preventing seizures, any of these require pharmacogenomics if you want the best response. Next slide. And this is the way the drug chart can come. Where you know this has increased toxicity, this is all the antihypertensive drugs, the different drug things, individual generic names, then the genes which are playing a role. The genes of your, the patient or the individual, I don't say patient because many of us are not technically patients, we are individuals who are using long-term medication. And then we know which is adverse reaction, with the green ones are the ones you can take, and so on. So this becomes a simple thing for a clinician to follow up. Because if you give them a whole lot of genes, they're not interested. They're interested only in the genes which they are prescribing the drug for. Next slide. So the take-home message is, 
one size does not fit all. We all are individuals, unique and lovely in, in our diversity. So a genomic test will help you decide what is the best treatment. And the hope is, next slide. The hope for the future is that a patient will go to the doctor, the doctor will order the genetic test, and based on the genetic report, prescribe the medicine for the best response. Thank you. Before I end, I want to say that in the medical field, at least in India, the curriculum, pharmacology is done in the first and second year. Later on, it is thought that the pharmacist should look after it. And I tell most of my postgraduate students that it's funny, you do five years of study, and then one person comes in a tie and recommends, give this medicine and you give it. Why? Because you don't think of the drug interactions, you don't think of all that, because you are prescribing the drug, because the world is pharma driven. The pharma recommends, and also for pharmacogenomics is not taught in our medical schools as yet. So there is, we are training genetic counselors who can help you bridge this between the diagnostic lab and clinician and the patient so that they can suggest which is the test required for your particular drug or the particular disease. So we have certified genetic counselors and Map My Genome also has. So if you have any queries regarding the test, please get in touch with them and they'll help you out. Thank you. Enlightening presentation, ma'am. I now invite Ms. Anu Acharya, CEO of Map My Genome, to address the gathering with a welcome address. So, good evening, everyone, and uh, I hope uh, you are all enjoying uh, you know, Dr. Annie's uh, talk. I wanted to make sure she talks so that you first get a sense of everything else that is going to be following that. I'm going to only be talking about a few stories uh, and, and talk a little bit about the product that we have. So, first of all, welcome everyone. We have a lot of distinguished panelists, doctors, uh, media people, uh, uh, friends. Uh, clinicians, uh, pharmacists, and everybody, I welcome all of you to the launch of Medica Map. Okay, so um, I wanted to start with a story which goes back 2,500 years ago. And this is the story of Pythagoras. I think all of us know about his theorem a square plus b square is equal to c square. Now there is another thing that came, comes with him, and I think uh, he had this intense dislike for fava beans uh, and, and, and I don't know exactly if what story is correct, there are multiple stories but the story that I found very interesting was that he said he was really really interested in talking about you know his dislike for fava beans. It so happened that uh, he comes to a point where he has to actually find you know enemies are pursuing him and he had to find a way to be able to actually uh, either you know, see the enemy face to face or pass through a fava beans field, right? And fava beans, for those of you who don't remember, I think this is also the same bean that was there in the jack and the bean stock, right? And so fava, fava beans actually cause what is called as a thalism. Now what happened is that the story goes is that because he went through these fava beans, he was found dead because he had a mutation in his body, which, which we know now, but at that point of time, I think it turns out that because of that, he, he was, you know, it basically caused that problem and there was a deficiency and I think Dr. Annie talked about the G6PD, um, the mutation over there. So I think that's where it all started and today, many, many years later, we are able to actually enjoy the benefits of pharmacogenomics in daily practice and that too at a very, very affordable price. So we'll move to the next slide. 
So the numbers really don't lie, right? I mean, we all have a lot of, uh, you know, all of us see that there are many, many prescription drugs that are out there. And I think we also see that a lot of drugs actually don't work for us. Uh, most of us will have somebody or the other who has probably faced an adverse reaction with drugs or we have found ways where, you know, something didn't work for them at all. And all of these are sometimes anecdotal and a lot of that depends on the doctor who's actually giving you that drug. So a lot of it is dependent on the expertise and whatever years of experience they've gained. But it's easier than that now, right? I mean, you, you see the thing that we, we are finding that Indians have a high frequency of a particular drug that is likely to be able to cause some problems in some cases. In some cases, for instance, if you look at the SIP to D19, I think that sometimes can be beneficial for clopidogrel, but again, negative for some of the things that are there, antidepressants. Uh, similarly, I think we see that, you know, you know in the average, 50% of the drugs can be wrongly prescribed. So there is a possibility that, you know, instead of depending on the experience and many, many years, if there are tools that we're able to help the practitioner understand and actually be able to deliver uh, you know, the right kind of medication to the right patient at the right dose, I think that's what is important. So, let's, so you, all you need to do is to be able to take a simple swap and be able to get that. Now, I know Dr. Annie also talked about Tylenol. And uh, I wanted to talk about one more story, which is not, of course, my own personal story, but this was a story that happened in the year 2006. And there was this uh, uh, woman who had just given birth to a child. And when this uh, child was born um, in the hospital, I think the mother had postpartum depression, was given Tylenol as uh, you know, a possible uh, you know, recommendation for to be able to, for the pain. Now this was Tylenol 3, which had acetonmorphine and codeine phosphate. And I think as you saw that codeine actually converts into morphine. She was breastfeeding her child. And what happened was that over, over the next day when she goes back, the child actually, she has breastfed the child and the next day they find that the child actually uh, dies, right? And this was because of the, the um, large amount of morphine that was there in the mother's breast milk that was then passed on to the child. So I think this is another story that we see that, you know, if you have a cell, and this doesn't happen to everybody obviously because otherwise this wouldn't be given to all patients. But I think the fact that it does happen, we need to understand who are the ones who are the ultra rapid metabolizers, who are the ones that are not. The next one. So I think uh, for, uh, for, for many of us, we don't realize that 75% of the drugs in oncology don't work for an average person, right? 43% of diabetes drugs don't work for an average person. 38% of antidepressant, and I remember this number very clearly from many years ago where we were discussing that a lot of antidepressant, and we have Dr. Uh, Daljeev here as well, uh, but a lot of times, many of the antidepressants don't work for one third of the patients, and many of the patients actually then give up because they don't find real value in it. And 50% of arthritis drugs also don't work on average. So I think if you look at it, a lot of drugs are actually not working for an average person. So but we are not average person. Each one of us is unique. And I think that's what is important. We want to make sure that for us, what, how do you make sure that you get the right medication? Next slide. So that's where we want to launch you know, Medica Map, which is the right medicine for you as being an individual. How can you get the right uh, medicine for your own, uh, for your own DNA? Uh, so why, what do you do with that, right? I mean, it's not like you have to uh, go through a very difficult process in order to get to, uh, uh, you know, getting a, a report that will tell you about what sort of uh, response that you have to individual drugs. Next slide. So I'll start with another story, and this is uh, Map My Genome's uh, story, uh, where we had a patient who was a 50-year-old uh, female, was uh, having coronary artery disease, uh, underwent PCI and was put on clopidogrel. Now, clopidogrel is obviously one of the most common drugs that is that is given to uh, patients with CAD. But we realized that she was a poor metabolizer of clopidogrel and that she may need alternate therapy, right? So the doctor then changed the medication to take out uh, Brillon. And today, I think she has no further events. She's perfectly fine. 
I think there's another such story where my mother herself, when she got, when she became diabetic a few years ago, we realized that she was having a lot of uh, challenges in terms of, you know, she had suddenly had completely was having lots of pains and she was not able to, uh, you know, she was really in a, in a state where it was hard for me to understand what was happening. So when I asked her, I said, have you changed something? And she said, yes, I've just been on, put on uh, metformin, which is a common diabetic drug. And we took that, met, we, we looked at it, we looked at her medical map report and we found out that that wouldn't work for her and, and therefore changed the drug. So I think this is something that we see that pretty much every one of us over here will have some instance where we'll be able to find uh, a particular way of fi finding how this product will be helpful for each of us. Next slide. Yeah. So I think, you know, if many of us think that we are all fine, you know, everybody is okay, but all of us, and 95% of us have some genetic variant which will make sure that we are not likely to be able to react well to every single medication that comes to us. So that is one. The second thing is, if there is somebody who has more than three medicines, rather than having just one, there is a chance of five to nine-fold times increase in terms of how they're able to react to these medicines. The other thing is, which is from a survey which was indicated, it said that 55% of the time, this was something that was cost effective. So if you actually did take, uh, took pharmacogenomics, this would be much more cost effective than if you did not. And these are some testimonials that are there, and I'm not going to read out all these testimonials, but I think what we're seeing, the first one was by a doctor who said that this was very helpful for her because she herself was asthmatic and was on a particular medication. We realized that we had to change her medication for it to be effective. And similarly, I think a lot of them have seen really beneficial value in being able to use products like Medica Map, which is a very cost effective way of understanding that. Uh, next, please. So I think, you know, uh, again, there are lots of different markers. Uh, you know, in our whole, whole human DNA, I think there is like 3.2 billion base pairs. There are obviously many different markers. Now, there are certain markers that are more interesting from a pharmacogenomics perspective than others. And I think what these graphs show over here is that these are the markers. Like, you look at the CYP2D6, and I think Dr. Annie talked about it. I took an example of that as well. There's G6PD, which was also an example that, that we both mentioned, the CYP2-19 uh, and so on. So there are many different markers. All of them have in different fields of speciality, whether it is in oncology, whether it's in, in uh, cardiology, diabetology, and so on. So it pretty much covers every single field that we are looking at. And that's the sort of the other graph on the, on the uh, top uh, right shows the number of drugs that the US FDA is currently releasing. Each of them have a particular amount of like a biomarker that is attached. So over the last five years, we see on an average, 40% or more actually have a marker that sort of tells you that these are likely to, you are supposed to get some sort of a genetic testing or there is some relationship with a particular genotype. And oncology obviously has pretty much 50% uh, of that market, but that's because it's something that a lot more research has happened. But we see that this is there in pretty much every single thing. And again, over here, you can see the ones uh, on the bottom right is the markers by specialty. So you see oncology, infectious diseases, psychiatry, uh, neurology, and so on. So there are many different markers, and each of these markers can be very, very helpful for us to be able to understand what drug is likely to work, what dosage of the drug is likely to work, and so on. Next slide. So what do we do in Medica Map, right? I mean, uh, essentially, you just take a little swab take anything that we can provide your DNA and uh, now you can do things where it can be your hereditary DNA or you can even look at things that are uh, you know your from a tumor to understand for for that particular case but let's right now focus on the germline which is more hereditary so we are looking at more than 165 drugs uh, that are there where you can understand that and all you have to do is to take a little swab get the DNA, once it comes to our lab, we are able to then process that and be able to provide a report. So you're looking at 165 drugs across 12 specialties, more than 50 drug classes, and in two weeks, we turn it around. So that means that any time you give a sample, in two weeks, you'll be able to turn that around. 
Uh, it's also compliant with a lot of regulations as well as we have taken a lot of data that comes from US FDA, CPIP guidelines, uh, the European Medical Association, and so on. So I think it was, it's important to say that um, you know, this is a affordable, non-invasive, and something that you can do at home. You don't have to go to any center. So if anyone is uh, prescribing this, it can be kept in the clinics. It can be also shipped to them at home and take a little swab and get that done. So it is, the price point we have, we have introduced is uh, probably the lowest anywhere in the world. Uh, and so you get about 40 rupees a drug. Uh, but uh, you have to obviously buy the whole thing. Uh, so it's 6,499 for about 165 drugs uh, that is there for a lifetime. So that's not changing. So you do that once and you have that. Next. So how it works is, and I think that's where uh, Dr. Ari Hassan's uh, presentation must have shown you that all you are doing is you're taking the SNPs or the markers that are there in each of, in, in your DNA and you use those, D those NIPs to be able to understand uh, which ones they categorized in different categories. So you have things that will show that you are these are effective, some of them are normal metabolizers, some of them are ultra-rapid metabolizers for the examples that we looked at, the Tylenol and others. And then there are some that can cause, uh, the, 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 because there are certain things that might cause more toxicity and they are not clearing those drugs away. So these are all mapped to a particular database and then we give a report that's fairly simple to understand. So the question a lot of people ask me is that, you know, why should I do a, a you know, Medica map, right? And I think it's important to understand that if you have this profile, this could be something that's part of what your, um, you know, medical records will be about, right? An emergency can strike any one of us, and, but it takes two weeks to be able to get it. So you want to make sure that anybody and anyone in this room uh, pretty much should have a profile that allows you to be able to understand if there is a particular uh, SNP that might predispose you to, to not, I mean, for that drug to not work or to cause uh, a particular reaction. The second is where people who are currently have a drug but they feel they're not getting the optimal value out of it, that could be another. In third cases, there are some that maybe have multiple drugs and while there are many other things other than genetics, uh, like your drug drug interaction, your food, your and your age, your uh, and many other such things. But I think this is an important element to, to understand. And then, of course, there are people who are just starting out on a new drug regime who want to understand how this can affect their uh, drugs and how they would uh, respond to them. Yeah. So we are compliant with uh, with all the regulations and the guidelines that are set. Uh, we are in a lab that is uh, regulated, I mean, which is an ABL. We have, uh, we also make sure that all the other regulations that we have, which are the PCP, NDT, the ISO, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So the most important thing, I think, you know, we've discussed a little bit, but the kind of specialties that we cover are not just oncology or not just psychiatry, but I think we are looking at things like cardiology, diabetology, infectious disease, gastroenterology, Neurology, neurology, general medicine, oncology, immunology, toxicology, and so on. So there are many different specialties that we are covering, and each of these specialties obviously has many different classes of drugs that are there. I'm not going to read all of these out, but there are lots of them, and they are there on the in the brochure that you have uh, on the table. So, but you can see that there are about 165 drugs that have some implication of the other. Next one. And that's the uh, sample that is used, either a swab or a or blood sample. And that's the process. Uh, so you get the sample, you get the um, DNA, and that goes through a process of lab processing. We put it on our own um, map my genome uh, special chip that we have created uh, on the Illumina platform. Then we do the data analysis, and then comes the report generation. So the report is, uh, and we have, we have taken this survey with a lot of people who are not doctors as well uh, to understand if the report was relatively easy for them to understand. And while these reports will be read by doctors, we hope that you know the fact that normal people can also read it makes it easier for doctors as well. So that's a sort of a snapshot of how the report looks like. 
we have uh, it divided by specialty and then by the class of drugs. So in this case, for instance, there's cardiology. We're looking at beta blockers, uh, statins, uh, statins being uh, a very, statins being something that are prescribed very very regularly, and I think in many cases can cause uh, quite severe uh, uh, cases of uh, graptomyosis or or other things that you can potentially prevent. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the kind of drugs that we cover in, in psychiatry and so on. And so the, the report looks uh, is about uh, 40, 50 pages long. There's a big summary of the um, of the drugs. Which ones in green work for you? In in orange, you need to do something. And red, maybe an alternate thing needs to be recommended. And then we go into details of each one of that. And I think in the details is the guideline for the uh, clinician that we tell them what CPIC guidelines are, what are they likely to be able to do uh, with, based on that information, and also talk a little bit about what marker is there and how that marker actually going to affect uh, the overall, uh, you know, how it's going to affect your own patient. So this is what it goes, so you can see that it is quite uh, detailed in terms of what you can get for each specific drug. Benefit. So I think, uh, you know, I started with Greek, I ended with Latin. Uh, so in case, I hope that this is not all Greek and Latin to you all of you. Uh, so it ends with dosis, soda, facit, penian, penian num, which basically stands for that the dose makes the poison. So basically, I think, you know, each one of us, I think, you know, while the same thing can be a medicine for someone, can be poison for another. And I think pharmacogenomics basically puts a lot of that in perspective. And again, this was somebody who wrote this many, many years ago. And uh, so a lot of things, a lot of those knowledge also comes into being. So with that, I'd like to, uh, you know, welcome all of you once again. And thank you very much. We'll follow it with a panel discussion after that. Thank you. Anumachari, CEO of Macmagino, and Ms. Adriana Lopez, as we have a few exciting announcements to make and a few collaborations to announce. better, empower them with the decisions of their own health, and helping the clinicians uh, take better decisions based on the knowledge of the patient.
Thank the chairs for the panel discussion. We have a short video that came from Dr. Kathleen Barnes, who I call her the pharmacogenomics queen. Um, she's based in the US. Uh, she's a senior uh, VP at uh, campus. So she has a very short clip for us. Some? Medicine at the University of Colorado here in the United States. And I just wanted to share a couple thoughts around pharmacogenomics. Big question is what is pharmacogenomics? We refer to it as PGX. And basically, it uses an individual's genetic information along with other clinical factors to make informed decisions about drug selection and dosing. And the goal of PGX is really to minimize trial and error that's associated with drug prescribing in order to maximize the efficiency and reduce adverse effects associated with that drug. This is really an exciting time in precision medicine because implementation of preemptive comprehensive PGX in the clinical study is really gaining momentum and this is due in part to the availability of the evidence-based clinical practice guidelines that give us the recommendations for translating PGX test results for a large number of drug gene pairs. Um, but also, this is combined with the ability to generate clinically actionable PGX data and integrate those results into the health system at um, costs that are substantially lower than before um, and really with, with great ease. Now, while there are tens of thousands of these variants that we refer to as drug gene pairs, to be precise, there's over 44,000 genome-wide PGX markers that span more than 2,000 um, pharmacogenomic targets. But these variants have been shown to potentially impact a patient's response to a specific drug. Now, in the clinical implementation of PGX, we think it's important to rely on recommendations from national and international reference organizations. These include organizations such as the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, we call it CFIT, or the Pharmacogenomics Knowledge Base, or PharmGAG. This ensures the strictest evidence-based decision-making around PGX. Why is PGX important? We think there's tremendous value proposition for comprehensive preemptive PGX to both the patient and the health system. On an individual level, consider that 95% of the population carries at least one genetic variant that's discordant with at least one medication. And 80% of the patient population will have an atypical response to a medication at some point in their lifetime. In the United States, we've estimated a $7,000 reduction in cost per patient with preemptive PGX. And comprehensive PGX also reduces costs associated with adverse drug reactions. So bear in mind again that at least in the US, adverse drug reactions have a significant impact on healthcare costs. It costs more than $30 billion annually, and it represents about 10 to up to 30% of all hospital admissions. Comprehensive PGX testing can predict 20 to 30 percent of those adverse reactions. It can significantly reduce adverse drug reaction associated deaths, and it reduces hospital admiss uh, admissions by somewhere around 50 percent. So, to this end, comprehensive PGX benefits a large proportion of the patient population in the health system. And then finally, how is PGX useful for clinicians? So as a provider, imagine a world where your patient's PGX profile is already captured in medical records. And at the time of prescribing, just as you would know whether or not your patient is allergic to a particular antibiotic, in which case you wouldn't prescribe that antibiotic, you would also know which antiplatelet drug to prescribe to your patient, which SSRI to prescribe to your patient with clinical depression, or whether or not the chemotherapy that's ordered is safe for the patient. And now imagine a world where that information on multiple drug gene pairs representing multiple clinical conditions that may be relevant to your patient throughout their life's journey is at your fingertips. So I'll close with, um, again, advocating for comprehensive uh, preemptive PGX in the health system. I look forward to hearing what um, you all are going to achieve um, in your system. And it's really a delight to share my enthusiasm about this, this area of precision medicine. Thank you. We now have a panel discussion on treat the person, not the condition.
For this, I would like to invite Mr. Harsha, Vice President of Product Team, Matt Magino, to moderate the session.
uh, in both the subsectors, interventional as well as the electrophysiology, it has got a strong basis and it is a need of the time that we should, what uh, Dr. Ani was saying, unless we are not having on the back of the mind that this may be a possible when she has seen her own son and she was having some basic knowledge that probably this may be driving, that's why she was able to uh, start uh, extrapolating the things and later on diagnosed and take <coughs> So, for the cardiologist, uh, I think uh, this type of programs as well as this type of uh, thought process should go at every level. We, when we go for the examinations, we, uh, if, uh, if uh, I think uh, the PGs who are there, our 40 to 50 percent questions are totally on the genes. But when we come in the practice, this gene, long QT gene, one is associated with chromosome number one. We only mug up like that, but when we come in the practice, we forget all those things. So it is they, they are knowing, but there are two aspects where we still lag behind. One is the uh, the availability of the test, because ho most of the doctors are working in the clinical setting. Though I am taking some more time, but uh, clinical practice, and there we want the report immediately, like. Uh, uh, our pathology and biochemistry reports. This report can't, so uh, what Anu has given a good opportunity that you should screen the patient first. Let everybody should know that my blood group is AG, A, A positive and these are the things I have to be transfused. Same time, if the patient who are now really asking the question from us whether I am going to develop particular disease or having the risk because my parents are having, can you give some answers to that? And this is the right thing that we should, as a practitioner, give opportunity to the patients that yes, you should go for the screening, keep these things in your record, and when somebody is prescribing the medicines, kindly give the information like I am, uh, uh, what do you call, allergic to prawns, I am allergic to. Uh, about the same information will make a lot of difference in the practice. Thank you. That makes sense. Right? So, uh, so, hi, uh, good evening, I'm, uh, Dr. Ashwani Dodd. You can hear me okay, right? So, I just, uh, I live in the Bay Area in California. I just traveled yesterday, pretty two hours of flight and all. So, if I sound jet lagged, uh, that's true. So, I'm very jet lagged. So, I'll, I'll keep it a simple. Uh, I think you simplified it so well that what is Bombacuri? genomics or pharmacogenetics or whatever you want to call it. I'll keep it very simple. I think uh, uh, as my experience as a clinician in, in healthcare IT, uh, EMR, which is medical records and then part of startups and so on and so forth, I'll keep it simple. It's like who, where and when. I think who is that we as clinicians or healthcare providers need to understand the importance of it. And as you uh, kind of uh, pointed out, that we are not taught about it in the medical med school as yet. And I think it should be part of the curriculum as medical informatics and other things. I think pharmacogenetics, as, as far as this portion of this, should be emphasized. People are aware, and that's not the problem, but where is it? So who is the kind of, all healthcare providers need to be aware of the importance. And where is that in all venues? So we should not think of that uh, somehow, I don't know, in the U.S. when it started, say, 10 years back, it was thought that it's only on cult. No, it's an everyday medicine that you pointed out. And some people have stories, so you should not have to go through a story to say that that's the model of the story. And when is that? I think it's at the point of care, and it should be preemptively testing done. And I, as a clinician, should have Today I'm looking at hepatic profile, renal profile, and I think should have a genome profile. I think we should, as uh, if we want to call ourselves leaders, emphasize to the people or the powers to be and you are looking for the minister to understand that we should make this as simple or as important as doing the blood. So my record should have an O negative or this is my hepatic or renal profile, and this is my genome. And this could be so, so dangerously effective or undo the danger if a patient presents in the ER and you are giving a medication thinking that you're helping them out. And in reality, you might be doing much harm. So I would say that when I say who, where, and when, if you want to, in the when part of it, if you want to prevent doing harm, 
then that's important that we have this as a part of day-to-day -day medical care. And I don't think it should have this kind of a connotation that this is something which is done rarely for oncology and all. It should be part of your doing a lab, you're doing labs, this should be for one of the labs to check mark and in US there should be a CPT code for it because we are so driven by the fair system of it. So that it's not that as a clinician I could justify to do this test. And it should be preempt you that you check in I'm talking about the US bill. So you take a patient intake, you should be part of that. And uh, I think what uh, your company is doing in creating a test which is easy to do, and I don't know how cost effective in terms of me going and justifying it to the pair to save, but I, I guess the ROI in itself is the cases you just predicted or talked about, that taking a simple Tylenol could create such a confusion because you are kind of creating, but I think the idea of the business was good to create morphine out of it, so I, I don't know whether we should do it. So, as I said, I, I just don't want to, so I've done enough of this that bring your own microphone, so I'll let somebody else speak as well. So, I, as I, I'll, I'll kind of uh, repeat and land it that who, where, and when. If we just take care of this, and I think as uh, healthcare providers, we need to convey it in a simple way. We don't get all those overlaps and all. Just say that if you want to prevent and not do harm to a patient and do effective care, this is one of the requirements. That's about it. So today you want to do a CT scan and MRI, and they have become part of the regular diagnostics kind of checklist. I think this should be one of them. And if we as healthcare providers or leaders can make the powers to be to understand and there are a lot of initiatives up told in India and this would become part of it. If you could have a Paytm with a Naria Pani order, so this could become as uh, adoption of such things is always a challenge. If we justify and can make a case, I think we should do it. Thank you. That's great. So we got the physician perspective. One is about like, uh, like there are a lot of use cases where it can be applied, and uh, there are like different uh, biomarkers, either blood biomarkers and genetic genomic information which can be used. And you were talking more about uh, how it should be incorporated into the curriculum and education, so that from clinical practice perspective, it's applicable. Yeah. So uh, uh, sorry to kind of interrupt here. So my thing is that uh, a lot of academic and philosophical discussions are doing, but it's like, let's do it. What's, what's the, how do you operationalize this and make people understand the importance of it? Otherwise, it will remain in the academic realms of some people who have PhDs written after their needs, understand the importance of it, uh, talk amongst them and agree on a point, but not having the operational effectiveness of day-to-day -day care. I think mean, that is what I'm trying to so to answer the operational effectiveness, maybe uh, Adriana with her uh, 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 pharmacology background, uh, sorry, uh, pharmacy background could help out. And uh, I think when we were discussing also uh, earlier uh, yesterday, we were talking about like how the healthcare system is kind of different than Spain and like pharmacists have like more power and all. So like if you could talk about like more, more about the how it's different in Spain and also like uh, from a clinical pharmacist perspective in terms of implementation of personalized medicine whether it's through genomics or through some other uh, data points how, uh, what are the challenges and like what, what are we, what are you seeing all the long so that would be great as well. It's, um, it's actually very interesting um, because in, in Spain, the healthcare system is majoritarily a public healthcare system. So, I, as a patient, the first contact I have with the healthcare system is not my primary physician. It's actually the pharmacist. Mm, the pharmacist is an MPAR with a five-year experience, uh, I mean, a five-year uh, training plus two years additional training of clinical pharmacy. And uh, whenever I have a flu or whenever I go to the pharmacist, saying, what, what do you recommend? And the pharmacist knows what, what I've been prescribed. He, uh, he, she has access to the entire uh, medical, not medical records, but what has been prescribed in my national healthcare card. And, and they're able to recommend. So, so having, um, involving more of, of, the, of the pharmacist, uh, of your local 
pharmacy in this in Spain is going to be it's, it's going to be critical. Um, oh, this is really reminding me of when we start when I started uh, working with the Spanish Ministry of Health over ten years ago. The conversation was around shifting from a disease-centric approach to a patient-centric approach, moving from a reactive healthcare to a proactive healthcare. And what we were doing was implementing different IT systems in each touch point of the patient with the healthcare system. Your primary physician, your uh, hospital, even we developed apps so that the patient could uh, put their basic parameters. But, but that wasn't enough. Underneath that, then we decided, okay, let's implement an I, uh, artificial intelligence system that can read thousands, even millions of electronic medical records and tell the clinician based on past experiences what are the best things to do. But this again is not based on your unique person, who you are, the genes that make you, right? So, so there was still a lag. And, and we are seeing now how the conversation even with the Ministry of Health is changing. And we are moving from that, um, that like, proactive healthcare to a more precision medicine. And, and it's a precision medicine that we talk about with four Ps. Preventive, proactive, um, personalized, and um, participatory because at the end of the day by making the patient know about their genetics what what makes you who you are you are able to also involve the patient in taking active decisions to change a lifestyle and the amount of money that this is going to be saving the public health care system the time the the errors the mistakes the toxicology all the all all the bad uh, parts of not treating not treating the patient and treating the disease are going to be avoided thanks to these kind of solutions so, so if i may i think maybe this is a good chance to pharmacogenomics as a part of a clinical decision support system, what's called a CDS. And right now we have those, we have algorithms, like algorithms built into the system, right from drug to drug allergies and simple drug to food. So this is in the US or? Uh, so I'm kind of proposing that this could be a part of a CDS, where then you could already have that built into an algorithm, built into the system that if you have deficiency of this gene, then this medication being so when I select this, I get a pop do that. So I think that, that would be the next kind of uh, facilitating uh, technology helping you make better, well-informed decisions. So I heard that in the US, so currently like in the US, like there's like a lot of uh, uh, drugs getting FDA, uh, uh, pharmacogenomic labels and all, and I heard uh, that in the, some of the EMR systems in the US, like once a, a physician prescribes a drug, get a notification yes. that there's some guidelines on it and the physician kind of makes the decision whether uh, he, he can override the guideline or like uh, he, can, he can make his own judgment based on the patient history. Yeah. Is so, that the case or? Uh, yes, yeah, so I've, I've lived that life for an almost more than a decade. So uh, there are two parts to it. Yes, there's a notification. This is called clinical decision support system. And that's what you're talking about. So yeah, that's what I was talking about. And then things like alert fatigue and all started coming in. So how do you, because sometimes in, in terms of medications, there could be the benefit to the risk ratio is more. So I, I'll give an example, you mentioned a renal and end stage renal disease. So if you're saying the creatinine is already, already about one or three or whatever, and if the system is built that serum creatinine is this much and you're giving an aflatoxin, should you still, so, the clinical decision supports are either handcuffs that they don't let you do it or they just present that, hey, this is, do you still want to proceed? So they allow you as a physician to make that final decision. So what I was proposing that we could have pharmacogenomics built into one as the component. So as far as pharmacogenomic kind of uh, profile being part of the medical record, some health systems have already started doing that. So that is already happening. Because the capability is there, it's just putting this into And some major health systems have started doing that. I'll uh, get back to you, Dr. Ashutosh. Uh, so you were mentioning like, uh, uh, so like you need like more kinds of data points to do the personalization, like whether it's like blood, uh, blood biomarkers or do some screening tests, and like even the uh, genomic, pharmacogenomic information would be helpful for your clinical care. 
So are there uh, any uh, specific uh, uh, conditions or use cases for which pharmacogenomics is like more useful and in your experience based on the cardiac patients and for uh, some cases you might uh, look for some other uh, kind of uh, data points to kind of make, make it more personalized. Yeah, uh, in uh, our interventional cardiology, there is a already uh, uh, regarding the clopidogrel is uh, one of the key uh, drug which we always uh, keep on checking whether it, the person is a good metabolizer or is a resistant. And particularly, it means it is happening uh, around this. It is not happening in the normal way. In the person when he started having more stent thrombosis, then they start checking. So still we are in the initial phase. We, people know that there is a there may be problem. Uh, if interventions do intervention, everybody blame he has not put a stent properly. Then he has to prove. See, I have put a stent properly, but the stent has been thrombosed because the drug was not proper. And this is the way we should give the information prior. If this type of test will certainly help you. When a person can afford to go for a stenting of 1.5 or 2 lakhs in a corporate hospital, I think 4,000 or 5,000 or 6,000, whatever is there, in parallel, it doesn't matter if you are doing a HIV, HVACG, HCV, why don't you put uh, this one and get it beforehand, the information that you are having particular gene which may be not suitable for topito, will better to go for prasugril or you can go for it. That is one part. Coming to the second part regarding uh, arrhythmia point of view, because all anti-arrhythmics are pro-arrhythmics. So we have to be very, very uh, uh, clear regarding which, drug, which patients, what drug we are giving, and what is the metabolizer level. Because a lot of time, we as electrophysicists, we are very open to start the anti-arrhythmic without any problem. But when it comes to the general cardiologist, or you can say intervention cardiologist, they always scared to start the medicines because of the pro -arithmia. because they are not knowing what will happen and they will immediately you are not the right person and you have put the drug that's why and I, I am seeing one or two patients who has put he said that doctor has put an and that's why my patient has developed VTVF and he he, he was been shocked and uh, I, I, I don't want him. are you uh, are you still feel that he has put the medicine rightly so that thing uh, I think uh, these questions can be answered by the uh, Medica map and those drugs probably like Avedron, which we need for most of the patient, underdosing, overdosing, and other than that, uh, and, and this tabigatron, uh, because this is the drug where we we struggle sometimes because some patients come with the bleeding and some patient doesn't respond. So their metabolization pattern, if it is added, it will certainly give uh, add on for us because these are the commonly prescribed medication in our practice. So personalization is very very essential, and in a in a, uh, in a scenario where the lawsuits are coming so frequently, uh, patients say we have not given information that this type of test is there. So everybody should be very uh, what you call informed that this is not a thing which we are imposing. We have to save ourselves to do the test, not only to save ourselves, the patient also at the same time because some drugs may be uh, going to create a problem for only one patient. And that one patient which is going to put a lawsuit against you. So it is our need that we should, to save ourselves and the patient, we should do the this type of genetical testing. And we should provide the information to the practicing spaces wherever. Because most of the, uh, uh, my madam is coming from Kamini, I, I know that uh, there may be, uh, people will be knowing that we are having particular doctor who will give the information. But usually people approach when it is, at which the problem is going on. Beforehand, knowing those things, starting the medicines while uh, this, uh, knowing the test uh, beforehand, it makes a lot of difference. So we have to start from the, not from the disease, we have to start from the person. Once he is not disease and we are starting the medicines. So that level we have to reach in the India and pro uh, particularly in the corporate hospital. Because where the intervention is there, cardiologists are very happy. Cost is never a cost. Uh, you can put at 27 lakhs a tower, they will be happy. But that same tower patient, you develop bleeding in the brain due to either the clopidogrel or anticoagulant has been kept. Everybody is so, no, 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 it is not uh, this. So I think all the high end procedures, wherever is going, that is must for them to save themselves. And secondly, 
if a patient is going for evaluation, add on of this uh, this evaluation will certainly make a difference for the patient's future perspective when we are prescribing the medicines or when he is coming to the emergency. So what you are saying that this should be standard practice of yes, and I think in that uh, uh, you know talk about making some of this as a standard practice. I think antenatal we should have this part like the, the story you just mentioned that. Some bread, some person breastfed their kid and the kid died because the mother had a decision or a, there was a genetic predisposition. I think we should make a case that uh, people who are all the, like uh, mothers to be should be tested for this. And you have a profile in improvement just like with one test. And uh, as uh, Dr. Moore mentioned, that why don't we, we are spending this much money on a procedure? Why don't we? front end that the standard practice that when you get admitted or this procedure is prescribed, this is a part of that. You are doing CBC this, this, and you are also doing your full uh, genome spectrum so that people can make decisions based or better or better informed decisions. Only thing what I find why it has penetrated in the uh, oncology because there is no intervention as such. So they are very medically driven, they don't want the side effect, they want effect also. So they are very much, uh, they want a precision whether I am going to start this drug, which is a very costly drug, whether it is going to be effective or not. They want upfront information before choosing the particular drug. But coming to the inter uh, in, in the cardiology, except for the electrophysiology, cardiology is more an intervention driven, I should not use the word market, but it is still a market. They always see the intervention as a the, uh, life saving procedure. But the best part is we are seeing all sometimes the prescription with 12 medicines. 12 medicines, how, why you are prescribing? What is the reason to give 12 medicines when two or three medicines which is not working, you have to take out at least and put the patient on the right dose of the particular medicines. But they don't have the information. Yes. yes. Throwing medicine at the patient is not going to be there. So, if uh, uh, Ormisatin is not working 2040, it's not working uh, clonidine. Clonidine also TID. After that, diuretics. After that, alert. But we should still see that whether the uh, orbisartan is a really a right drug or it is a tepisartan or it is a, some other variant of the same class. It makes a, a lot of difference in the cost also and the quality of life. Because taking so many pills it is, from this side is very easy, but when the patient, if it is your parent, how difficult it is in the 70s, 60s and 70s to consume particular medicine at a particular time. Very difficult. So what should I think? What is changing now uh, with regards to a few years ago is now there's a conversation happening around the advantages beyond uh, the advantages in oncology, which as you said, it's, it was their only kind of like hope, right? Right, right now we're expanding beyond oncology. I see, I see my father using this also in his medical practice in infectious diseases, and and how useful it is for that. My mother also using it in uh, in neurodegenerative diseases. So I think that there's a conversation that has to happen around this because one of the major changes, which is the availability of the diagnostic kits, is there. The the advances the uh, in the recent years, and especially during and after COVID, that has happened in the molecular diagnostics field has been phenomenal. Now you have so many new techniques uh, at a very cost-effective price. Now it's about uh, starting to incorporate it in the clinical guidelines and starting to incorporate it um, also in the education programs. Um, when, a, when a person is studying medicine, they should, they, it should, there should be more of also the implications of genetics and not as just a subject that you oversee and, 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 and just uh, of the, the, what the DNA is, right? There should be a clinical, uh, a clinical part to the genetics, but not only in medicine. Um, nurses should also know this. Pharmacists should also all know this. Providers. All healthcare providers should have a knowledge of this. So, so the other thing is that if we are now looking at doing this, I think all of us agree, it's the, so health, health is practiced the same way, but provided differently. So what's the appetite in countries like India where it's kind of a hybrid of some insurance coming in and, and then you are living in a like, world where it, everything is provided. So how do you justify and have those people who are making, how healthcare is provided different in different countries, like how does this get incorporated in a country like India? Should it be driven by the healthcare community because 
there is not a pair involved, but there is some. So how would you kind of, does it happen at the hospital system in your case? Whereas for me, I have to justify to the payer that you got to pay for this because then you will have to spend $100,000 taking care of that side effect. Now spend $1,000 and get that practice or that test done. So how would you do that in your country? Yeah, uh, in our country, first of all, there is a two uh, inertias. Uh, number one inertia is at the level of doctors. They are not aware, they are not knowing, and the language of genetics and the clinical practice is totally diverse. Uh, the Jit is sitting, I, I see, we will be knowing a lot of aspects because we as a doctors practicing only on the medicine, it is not working, change this one, not working, this. but we never analyze like a engineers who always analyze the things, why it is not happening, listen, because I, I saw the, how, how they have been brought and how we have been brought. That is one. But whether an inertia is there and we, uh, we go like uh, in, in our country, it is not a uh, training is not like a, uh, in a right way. We can say we learn by apprentice. We see he is doing, I should also do. It's the way it goes in our country. I should not say, but it is the fact. So, so if you are in a school, or your medical school is not having those practices, if a person develop drug, um, I have been trained my EP practice in uh, Malaysia. So this, I thought it is a third world country, but when, when, when it comes to the practice, they, they were using all the things, what is available in the US and in the left and right. They are not having any cost cutting because it is a National Heart Institute and whatever investigation they want. So when a person, uh, when a patient develop uh, this, this toxicity, I just say, probably it is a desire by, by seeing the ECG. Okay, sir, I have sent the digit, uh, digit, uh, digital level and digital bind is ready. Okay, how come? Okay, yes, we are having this thing and uh, within uh, 24 hours we will be getting a report. In our country, it is a big news if, we are, uh, if somebody has sent this report because it has never been practiced. And uh, getting a digital bind is a big thing. So, it, how the institution or the training program, particularly I will say internship or the post-graduation, if we are not bringing the curriculum of thinking that yes, there is a drug also and drug related things other than the intervention, it is not going to take a, the clinical discussion should always in, include the pathologies, biochemistry and at the same time the world and the same of the genetist also or gen, uh, the persons who are practicing that they can give insight you are missing somewhere and whatever biochemical you are saying it may be having this thing also and you have to think from that perspective which is lacking in most of the medical colleges and where the thing that's why it has not taken in our practice that uh, sorry i am going to uh, ask that we uh, <laughs> So uh, that's why uh, in our practice, when uh, uh, we are going in most certain institutions, the thought process never comes that there can be uh, underpinning of genetical problems, except for some of the divisions like oncology. There is having from that uh, when you are doing the DNA, they will say, "Oh, you are starting tamoxifen. This has to be done." When I approach to my oncologist, I ask, "Sir, the patient is having uh, CLL and all." What is the, this level of five, five panels I am sending just to get it? After that, I will tell what is the prognosis. That is the way they do it. But as a cardiologist, any time you say, my patient is not doing well on three beds, no problem. I am having the other choices, we will give it. So that way goes when interventions penetrate the particular, intervention driven uh, uh, what you call field is spoiling the use of the particular medicines or we can say the personalized medicines which is need of the time. I think a uh, few of the audience had a few questions, so... Hi. I'm, my name is Girira Chandak and uh, I'm an MD, PhD. I work in a research institute here in Hyderabad. We do a lot of work on single gene disorders and complex disorders. So it's really a pleasure to have, you know, two Indian experts who are sharing their knowledge of practice from USA. Uh, Anu always comes up with, you know, bright ideas like this also. But uh, I play probably the devil's advocate also. This is a wonderful idea and I remember when, as Anu was saying that about MTHFR and others, you know, we have been thinking about this for a long time or so. My question to both of you is that uh, whatever experience you have, this is over decades, you know, 
I'm sure that a similar situation would have existed at some point of time in US, right? And uh, as Dr. Ashutosh mentioned that it's not only the clinician, but the patient, the nurse, everybody has to be in the system, right? And uh, medical curriculum or other things are not likely to change immediately. So I'm looking for a solution that this whole concept has come up. I'm not going to go into the details of other goods or bads of our country, but considering the current situation of population, the, the economic status and the awareness amongst the clinicians or the other people, how do you think this would fan out, you know, and what sort of uh, plan you would suggest? I'll request, uh, uh, sorry for the long question, but I thought it would be good to have your experience from that. Uh, both Dr. Ashutosh and Dr. Sir, I am basically from India, I am not from US. No, no, I, if, I thought you <laughs> you were in US only because I, I am sorry, so, the so way, the way you were the... putting India, I couldn't, I couldn't really, it looked to me that you have forgotten what things are there in India. So <laughs> yeah. I would really like to know from you uh, how yeah. to change it, you know, in, so, in such a so short time. Do you want me to answer first? Please, yeah, please. Yeah, so I think uh, what all of us agree on one thing, that it doesn't matter which country we are talking about, I think eyes don't see what the mind does not know. So we need to start it from the basics. So if I'm going to the med school, I need to be trained to know the importance of this. And that should be the first starting point. So as a physician, when I understand the importance of it, I will make the case for it that this should be part of my practice. So it has nothing to do. Then what you are talking about is more of a resource and but I'm so, so, last year I came to India after 12 years. I'm so impressed that you and me using technology is no big thing, but I went in Mumbai to an Arya Pani guy and I first said that I'll pay, the guy said, sir, pay TMD. So if we could do that in a population of one million people, I think if we have people in the position of making decisions, incorporate it right from the medical school that this is one of the subjects you have to understand because this will help you to prevent doing harm. Leave aside doing good, prevent doing harm, then that will percolate slowly and these things take time but that is I think the starting point. And then you could do, as we say in US, you could chew the gum and walk as well. So you could start that stream from there and go and address from the <coughs> clinical leadership to make that wherever, so if I am running a hospital or a system, then I should, or I am the leader of cardiology, I should make that change from top down, saying that this is the advantage of that. And then you come to the system of how healthcare is provided, whether you are lucky to be in a place where everything is state provided, or we have a hybrid system, or it's a pair system. I think these are three swim lanes we have to work on. One is teaching the person who is going to be the healthcare provider, making it part of their curriculum. Oh, no, 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 the second no. is that if oh, no, we are at a position to make that change oh, or to affect no, no. that change, we should be able to A, manage it down, <coughs> that is make it a standard practice and manage it up and like if the Honorable Minister was there, to make him understand what is the importance. And we have the experts to do that. So I don't think it's a kind of dissing the country or anything. I think it's that these are different ways of providing care, but we can <coughs> do standard care everywhere. I think that is my simple <laughs> word. I hope that helps. Yeah, that, just uh, insurance part that I just sense? wanted to uh, understand because everything in US is... So, so I, I'll tell you a simple thing. So today we have in it's coming everywhere. So if let's take, keep it very simple. A heart failure patient is in a hospital and we can today use data to predict what is the readmission risk of this patient. So I can then go to the payer and the insurance person saying that if we do this, then today we will be spending thousand dollars. But if we don't do this because they understand the dollar. We can say that this patient will come back and you will be spending $100,000. They will say, yeah, do the 1000 So 
The persuasion can be different, that's making the case. But we could keep it simple, teach the person who's going to be the healthcare provider, you're the leader affected downstream and upstream, make the powers to be understand that this will be good for the people. I think that is a very simple case to make. I know I'm kind of simplifying it, but I think we can do it if we are able to. Uh, one thing I just wanted to add, uh, our perspective is when we are medically trained, we have seen most of the time the medical school and the patient what we are catering. And the same thing we keep in our back of the mind when we come in the practice. The same thing, I, because I, I have been trained always in the medical colleges, which is from the government run, and what the, what sort of patients we are seeing. They are long queue, they are standing, like all the poor. And when we come in the corporate sector, when we are practicing, we keep the same thing, the cost is very high. But frankly speaking, we should first of all uh, take out the mentality that we are poor country. That is wrong. Poor mentality is different thing, poor uh, country is different thing. We think that when a person can come, you can go and see the malls, how they are built up. 6,000, 5,000 is not a cost. What they are getting a lifelong list of the drugs which should be avoided, which should be practiced. Coming to the second point regarding in India, India, we, uh, when, how you are going to present the particular topic that makes a difference. You get, anytime you have some leader of the cardiologist or oncologist speaking that genetics is must, gen, oncologist they are practicing it, so there is no need of speaking, but cardiologist or the, any other division, they are not coming on the forum that that is going to, because it is not an intervention. When intervention comes, Everybody want to take the support of the pharma company. They want to show that I am the leader and really want to be leader. But this is the area where really we need leaders to come on the forum. They should say that yes, this is going to make some difference in your life. And what price uh, this map my gym, you know, I have gone through all there, starting from 27,000 to 6,000. It's not a big cost. It still can be managed because it's a one-time investment. You have not to do it time and again. So one-time investment for HCM patient. One politician has come to me. He was saying, sir, you are the first person who is diagnosing that my uh, boy is having uh, HCM. Are you sure? When I, yes, I am sure. Because I have seen your echo. Most of the reports are fine. You are thinking that his uh, giddiness is due to the uh, more taking food and uh, sleep apnea. But it is clear-cut HCM. <coughs> I want, if you really want, I, anyhow we have to stratify which type of gene is associated and not only him, his brother who is a twin, he is also needing it. And we have done and we have diagnosed that case and he was also get convinced what are the prognosis over the time from starting from when he is around 17 years, what will be the progress. He was saying I was not doing, I, I was not knowing that these are the facilities available. You have not to go to US, everything is available in our uh, uh, city. So. First of all, awareness and we should take out the price part. Price is very, well, I, I think, uh, cost effective and we should try to, I, I am not saying promoting, but we should give the choices. Transplants, once upon a time, nobody was seeing. One patient came and said, sir, why you have not given me the transplant option or device option? I would have chosen. So they start fighting with us, uh, us why the choice has not been. First we have to give choice. And time and again, if we are going to cases, sir, certainly they are going to take it. Yeah, I, I, I'll, just say, I'll just make one statement that I'm not talking about cost or anything, okay? So please, Anu, don't think that I'm saying that this is cost is very high or whatever. I am only looking at this, this test becomes popular in Hyderabad that goes to different parts of the country. So please, I think that point should be taken out of this. So I will take it Thank from you. there. Uh, myself, I'm Dr. Varpal Singh Malhotra. I'm heading uh, 100 clinics for Oro Sugar Clinics. Mostly, mostly my work is for diabetes and endocrinology. I'll just make a comment and then ask a question also. So start, I think it's a, I, there's no iota of doubt, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's been gonna be useful. Uh, I will start with a, you know, comment from Dr. Ashutosh Kumar, he mentioned about allergy. I had a, you know, a discussion going around with the physicians and they, there was a, a doctor who died in Singapore uh, due to having crustacean food. And also another friend of mine, he had a uh, <clears throat> anaphylactic attack, uh, having drumsticks, which is very common in sambar. So this is a, I think that's what we are starting from, from allergy. But uh, having said that, uh, it's I think it's important to have that bit, and it, it will be very useful. But only thing is, 
innovation and upgradation. That question is to you and Adriana and Manu also. So, see, I see the diabetes uh, drugs, we have bioglides, we have uh, sulfonurias, but now latest drugs being DPP4, SGLD2, even uh, analogs, we have semaglutide. So, I think uh, what's your take on that? But anyways, it's good and all. I congratulate uh, the organizers and everyone. Thank you so much. If you could keep the comment short because we have overshot uh, this thing. Okay. So. So, so I think your question is how are they going to upgrade to the newer drugs and get that profile set? Sure. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to do that. So I'd like to answer. So I'll just keep it uh, to answer that. Basically, we have been looking at pharmacogenomics profile. I think as long as it's given in the US FDA marker and it's statistically significant, that's when Dr. Sandhya will let us put it in the, in the product. So we'll definitely add as soon as uh, as soon as we are able to uh, add that and see that it is significant for, for this product. So thank you for that. I think uh, we, uh, we should take the drugs which are which are very costly and which the patients are not ready. Like Rivals is, is a very common drug. 132 rupees one tablet is costing and they have to take at least 6 to 9 months. So those drugs should be on, take on a priority and we should just give the answer whether you will be effective or not or what type of metabolism is going to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I think they will obviously do as the new drugs come and they will put that as a portfolio of drugs. Yeah. I just want to add one little thing. Uh, eventually, what we're seeing uh, at least, uh, at least what we're seeing in Spain, in the way that both the public and the private healthcare system are starting to incorporate and grow on the different types of, of medication that, uh, that that is tested in pharmacogenomics, it's because they're included in the clinical guidelines. So, the, um, for us over there, the clinical guidelines are, are done by a multidisciplinary group of, of healthcare professionals, geneticists, pharma, uh, clinical pharmacologists, everyone. Everyone from around, even uh, people who are doing laboratory research, and and they're the ones who are, are coming up with the right guidelines for each um, for each disease, uh, especially especially for us the non-communicable diseases, the diabetes, hypertension, and all. And uh, what are the new treatments that are coming in the market, and should we include these as uh, as part of the pharmacogenomics program? So, for the test, should you so, use uh, I think we almost got our time, but like, let's close on that note. So all the people, like whether it's clinical uh, genetists or like doctors, everyone has to contribute and uh, uh, like promote uh, this kind of pharmacogenomic test and make it like more part of the practice. Oh, one more question. Okay, so again, uh, brief comments. Somebody has a question. Yeah, go ahead. So they gave you a free mic. Yeah, uh, so, so uh, along with Dr. Ali Hassan, I am witnessing the journey of uh, genetics uh, in pediatric neurology since 2014. And uh, congratulations to team at my genome, such a wonderful test. And being a pediatric neurologist, our kids are unable to express. Like to give the example, when we start the uh, Alpiprazole or Respiridone in a child with uh, autism. Few kids they become very good uh, uh, behavior wise and hyperactivity wise. But few kids rebound, they become hyperactive. So definitely this is a useful test for pediatric population. But uh, India now, money is not a major issue. Still it's major issue, I'm not saying. But when it is available and affordable, definitely it is very, very useful for clinician. So this question to uh, Andiana Lopez and Anu, uh, what is the sensitivity and specificity of this test being a clinician because we are answerable to uh, medical councils, even our colleague when we write it, whether it is ethical or not because definitely we would like to use this test, a very very useful test for pediatric population. I think Harsha can answer also, but I'll answer it right here. You don't have a mic there. So basically we do it, uh, so from a micro perspective, the, we have a 99.9% .9 call use. The markers that we have selected are all US FDA validated markers and from CPA guidelines. So we have not taken anything that is, you know, not uh, validated enough. So you can use it without, without feeling uh, worried about the consequences of that. 
Uh, on that note, I think we'll close our panel so that we can move on to the next panel. Uh, thanks a lot for an interesting discussion, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
request Dr. Pramjit to please come on the channel for presentation. We now have a second panel discussion, pharmacogenomics and clinical setting, and the moderator for this session is Dr. Dave. He's our medical advisor at Magma Genome. Good evening, one and all. So I would like to welcome the second panelist, uh, Dr. Surya Balakrishnan. Uh, she is senior genesis at CCMBO and Apollo, and Dr. Amrish Ra is head of cardiothoracic and vascular surgery from NIMS, and Dr. Sandhya Kiran, who is head of bioinformatics at Magma Please welcome. Oh, good. 
Good evening, everyone. So, so I would like to start with Dr. Ramesh, since we were also discussing about uh, how pharmacogenomics, how you are using it at your own institute. So, would you want to shed a little light on how it is useful and how beneficial it is, and how has it been in your practice? Unlike most, most clinicians, I could say that I have a lot of practical experience with this. Uh, and it is on both sides of the coin. Uh, we do a lot of class placements and we use a lot of water. Much of it is for poor patients. So one day, Dr. Vijay Kumar, who was in the department, uh, he approached me and said, I'm just finding it difficult to actually conduct a study on pharmacogenetics for that. Can you be the clinical friend for that? So my only role was to provide them with patients so that they can do a proper study. You know, there's a difference, basic difference between the clinicians and uh, uh, you know, basic sciences people is that we are very much outcome oriented and the labs people are very much process oriented. There is an inherent conflict between them. And uh, so he was not finding people who would uh, respect the process. So I said, fine, we'll do this study. And then we found out that uh, then uh, we reached an uh, algorithm. The end result of the study was we got an algorithm, AX plus B, Y plus C, Z plus B, is equal to the, uh, the therapeutic dose of water and we could be reached. And uh, then we realized that if we use that algorithm, 85% of the times we are getting it right, the therapeutic dose right, the range right. And if not, we were 60%. You know, our attendance was 60 percent, and probably that would have gone down further if it were not for the uh, experienced clinician prescribing it. How did we succeed? Did we really succeed in uh, getting it implemented on the ground level? Uh, then I realized that this looks good, and uh, more than anything, it was a guide to which we could titrate our patients. So, but eventually we realize that instead of getting this test done for all the patients, they were only doing it for patients who were in the extremes, who were the outliers. So the, the ones who didn't have uh, within the therapeutic range. So that uh, when we were uncomfortable with our traditional dosing, we would tend to go towards that, uh, we would take it as a median and we would tend to go to err on the side of uh, the suggested range. All said and done, I couldn't convince any of my colleagues to adopt this test. And eventually, then I, I did my healthcare management by SDI. This was always a frustrating thing for me. So then I realized probably the way to, way to go about it is to flip the entire model. You know, these, these kind of algorithms can very easily be easy. What does the patient come to me for? He said, this is my PDILR report. Can you adjust my dose? And I just make a guesswork and send him back. Say, so get a test repeated after three days, after four days, after one week and all. He has to come all the way from wherever he is, get an attendant, get himself trained and all. Now there are fees, now there are quick uh, tests like you have for diabetes, blood sugar, you have those. And these models can very easily be combined with AI or any of the basic, uh, basic computational things that can very easily combine. And you can do away with the patient's doctor visits. So I think the industry has to flip the entire model where it is trying to bring in these tests to the doctors. I think they should bundle it into something else. This is not my domain, so I can't. Uh, but from a, uh, from an experience point of view, I realized very difficult to convince doctors for the basic things. Secondly, when it came to clopidogrel, we had a thesis study from one of our people where they studied uh, whether they were clop uh, whether the platelets were aggregating or not. So 40 percent did, 40 to 45 percent did. So clopidogrel wasn't working in almost 45 percent of the patients. Yet we keep prescribing it. So, so when you when people are talking about cost of the test and all, I think the real thing you should look at is not the cost, but you should look at the value. What is the value? What value is the patient getting? She is consuming a tablet with potential side effects and it's not working good in the dark. So why is it a no-brainer that we should be doing these tests? We are not doing these tests anymore. So why you know, any amount of bombardment to the doctor is not right? Because they are cheaper alternatives. What if, uh, you know, I, it's easier for me to 
it's easier for me to play around with therapeutic doses of warfarin. It's easy for me to combine two, three, four antiplatelet drugs. It is easy for me, uh, you know, I do transplant. So if a patient is a tacrolimus, rather than find out whether tacrolimus works for a patient or not, it's easier for me to keep doing therapeutic levels of tacrolimus and uh, titrate the dose. It's much easier. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, at least, uh, at least my lung cancer patients, I do a biopsy and EDA pass studies are uh, okay. <laughs> it's one way for me to get rid of a patient because most of the lung cancers are not uh, operable anyway. Uh, so I feel it's, it's I, I mean, it's sound, sounding very cynical, but it's useless to get the doctor community going to, you know, try to popularize the, the doctor community. Uh, the models have to be flipped over. No out of the box solutions have to come. Probably you can launch a kit which says that uh, this is your uh, uh, this is your blood thinner kit or this is your pre uh, you know uh, somebody might pop and, uh, might bundle it as this is your pre intervention kit uh, in which you do HIV, HIV, CG and these things or, or this is your pre valve uh, replacement kit. Uh, so you, know, you do all these tests and you bundle it. At some point, some different business models have to come. While we can argue till the cows who come home that these are beneficial tests, but the adaptability is very poor because there are a lot of cheaper alternatives available. Nobody, at the cost of sounding repetitive, nobody is uh, bothered with the cost anymore. But I think people have to pay a lot of focus on the value, and uh, that's why it's all more important than your models come. Uh, I totally uh, agree with what Sir said. I think it's very difficult to kind of make the clinicians understand uh, and, uh, you know, especially when it comes to uh, certain comprehensive things about genetics, right? Uh, but I think we are making a headway. I don't think, uh, you know, clinicians are less aware about genetics now, especially in Hyderabad. I think we are starting at, uh, you know, uh, just few clinics or few hospitals uh, by the month or say maybe a couple of years, right? And I totally get about the warfare thing. We used to do this trial and error and the moment you see that the patient's INR is actually not picking up, you there are better functioners now. Instead of going for a profiling, I think many of the clinicians actually choose to go for better uh, anticoagulants like Dabigatran or Epixabran. So, all that uh, said and done, but I feel that pharmacogenomics is like the welcome kit that you can give to the clinicians to lure them into this Pandora box of benefits that genetics has to actually offer. So pharmacogenomics is just one aspect of what the genetics can actually offer and how it can transform the medicine completely. So uh, it is guidelines recommended and totally eliminates this uh, trial and error way of, uh, you know, prescribing a medicine. There are three uh, ways in which you can implement it. First is the targeted therapy. That is, you have a specific genetic variation in a patient. You choose certain drugs which specifically work on those patients. Like, sir said, EGFR, right? So you have this genetic and uh, it has had tremendous benefit in lung cancer patients, sir would agree. I mean, there are now the overall survival has picked up so much. It's beyond five years in some patients. So it's really great to see those, you know, uh, benefits in a patient. And especially in oncology, you see a lot of targeted therapies uh, making its uh, way. So that is one aspect. And then the second aspect is to determine the sensitivity. That is how uh, well or efficiently the drug is able to work in a given person. So if you take diabetes for example, there are certain genetic variations based on which you can actually prescribe the sulfonylureas. So those patients respond better and sulfonylureas are actually very cheaper as well. So it works out. And then there is a third uh, aspect where you can actually prevent the adverse reactions. Like in many patients, like a lung transplant, which Sir mentioned, you have a lot of these immunosuppressants, uh, which are really uh, toxic to the body, right? So you have the you have to put the patient on really heavy doses of this azathioprine and tacrolimus, and uh, in HIV patient, abacavir, right? 
So before you subject these patients to these kind of treatments, which are quite toxic and also expensive, right? And sometimes the reactions can be really deadly, right? So these are the three ways in which you can actually harness the potential of pharmacogenomics in your clinical practice. And I really feel that pharmacogenomics is a better way to kind of introduce the clinicians to genetics because uh, you know uh, most of the genetic disorders are now actually uh, you know being emphasized. But I think it is yet to make a really solid entry into the clinical practice, and I feel pharmacogenomics is the way to do it because it is it has incentives basically in your practice, right? So I think uh, this is a really good uh, kit that we should use to the maximum and awareness it grows. I mean, we are not the same person who were yesterday, right? So clinicians will also grow up to it and I'm really hopeful. Really yeah. hopeful about it. So yes. can you tell us about your journey? So your journey. So you were a doctor, a medical doctor, who then went on to pursue genetics and you <laughs> and you are practicing at both CCMU and uploading. Have you gone through any cases or would you want to enlighten on any such case which you have noticed in, with respect to pharmacogenomics and the benefits? So, uh, let me tell you this upfront that, you know, as a clinical geneticist, you are not really dealing so much with the treatment aspect. But yes, during my internal medicine period, we, we have seen a lot of patients on warfarin, like Sir said, who are not, some of them would not respond and some of them would actually be overly sensitive to it, right? And of course, G6PD, which is routinely done right before you actually administer an anti-malarial for a patient, right? So these are the common examples that we used to see. But as a clinical geneticist, uh, since I'm also interested more in oncology, I do uh, go through a lot of this targeted therapies and uh, it's really brilliant, you know, what science has achieved in the last 10 years. Right uh, from the beginning uh, when this Philadelphia chromosome was actually discovered and, you know, you had imatinib made available. It brought in uh, such a drastic, uh, you know, survival of the patients with CML. So CML is no longer a very deadly cancer and you know there are patients who are actually on multiple lines of this tyrosine kinase inhibitors and still doing really well. Of course there are a little bit of issues with resistance and things like that but you always have a better drug which is you know made for that particular resistant mutation and then it is over, uh, able to overcome that as well. So it's very, very satisfying to see such uh, amazing things happening in the field of genetics on a daily basis. And then to actually see its effects in clinical practice is something more gratifying. Uh, and I think any doctor would be really happy to actually see that as well. Of course, at the end of the day, we are really happy once our patient has gone to a better place and the outcome obviously makes us feel very happy. So I want to direct a question to Dr. Sandhya, who is our bioinformatician. So since he's also had a question about how we choose, I mean, why are we not reporting the newer drugs? So can you talk a little bit about how we get to deciding which markers to choose and what is the protocol and how do we do the whole uh, testing exactly? <laughs>
see, I started my whole farm working on the journey with CYP. I mean, I don't see it in the report. To me, this is also, uh, you know, uh, it influences the uh, metabolism of a lot of drugs. Yeah. So, if you are able to get 26 on board, I think it will, you know, cover many drugs. Some markers were not there on Illumina chip, but now we came up with our own custom chip on the VR. And also, sir, again, coming back to you with respect to curriculum and including how much genomics to be one of like, the bigger branches with respect to, uh, you know, uh, as a medical student, what do you think is the future about, uh, with respect to pharmacogenomics? I think we already had this discussion that uh, it needs to be included in the I think awareness is there. There's no doubt about it, awareness. But it has not translated into clinical practice. What are the challenges of it being translated into clinical practice? One is, there are other alternatives available. So, as I say, uh, Netflix, competitor for Netflix is not other uh, players, but it is three. <laughs> Sleep is a competitor to Netflix. Similarly, they have realized that competitors to candy is not the other candy makers. It is the use of ADMs and digital things because earlier they were giving out candies instead of change. Now that has stopped. So similarly, uh, you have to realize that while pharmacogenomics may be such a wonderful thing, the clinicians are just not buying it. Because there are other alternatives. Uh, you know, why, it's, why is oncology, why is it popular in oncology? Because there are very few alternatives in oncology. If I want, my wife is an office surgeon. She does so much of breast recovery. So, if you say that you need to start this drug which each cycle costs one, one and a half lakhs, at least they should give a reasonable estimate that this is going to work for you. But that might not work if I want to give a 10 rupee tablet or a 5 rupee tablet. You get a 6,000 rupee test for a, for a tablet of 5 rupees, sounds very... So that's where, you know, that's where you have to educate regarding the cost versus value. So uh, that's why I always feel that the value, uh, because the physician will look at the cost, but the patient might look at the value. So I think, uh, you know, that, uh, since these are not working, see, well, you may feel that it has grown a bit, uh, this market has grown and there's more awareness. But you've been lock, knocking the doors for far too long. Flip the model now. If the door is not knocking and it's not opening, you have to look at other doors. Why don't you call If you look at my practice, whenever a patient is there, whenever I see a post-operative patient, 10 relatives surrounding him will come to me and say, Doctor, what should I do to see that I don't get, get in like him? So I think instead of me, the, instead of going through me, you may go try to go through the patients. The patients might be interested. Does your tablet really work for you? Is your stent going to get blocked? Uh, these simple tests might decide whether your stent will get blocked or not. Then he might question the doctor and then doctors might find it more acceptable. So somewhere along the line, uh, Though it's, a, though it's a scientific discussion, we are supposed to be making a scientific discussion, but somewhere along the line, the science is there, you know, it is undisputable. But if the whole thing is how do you, know, it's, it's become more of a technical discussion rather than a scientific discussion. Yeah, in fact, uh, I mean, the ways are such that in oncology, the patient hopes that he has the mutation because you can apply one or the other targeted therapies and you know something is available to say that you know prolong the life. So that's how it is. But I would also caution, please don't let this uh, report get into the hands of your enemies. <laughs> right? You will be back in the hospital with severe reactions. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I mean, uh, like Sarah said, uh, the entry point I think should be uh, basically the medical workers in association with a lot of counselors, right? So, I think that will be a very strong model. Of course, you have to introduce genetics into your curriculum, all that I agree, but definitely 
uh, I think uh, you have to involve more traditions and more counselors. Give the support of counselors to the traditions, basically, because they don't have so much of time to actually sit and discuss the or address the concerns that the patient or the family might have. So it's always a very good idea to kind of team up the clinician with the counselor and then uh, have these, uh, you know, kids being delivered to the patients on slow. I mean, slowly but steadily we be there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we are running out of time, so I think it was a really nice discussion, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Just as a concluding remark, years ago, we were taking pulse, EPR, BP, temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure. Those were the things to monitor a patient. But those were the only things which were available to monitor. Today, we have a million things with which we can monitor, but we are still stuck with the same old things. Why? We have to introspect why. It is not because of lack of uh, technology or lack of information available, but somewhere around the line we are unable to disseminate the information and somewhere around the line uh, we are failed to show value of adding these to our, uh, to our programs. Hopefully it is going to be better as the time passes. So, uh, and thank you so much sir. Uh, thank you ma'am. Thank you ma'am. I think I'll hand it over to Vaishnavi. So we now have a testimonial video from our own patient who has taken up Medica map from Map My Genome. Could you please play the video? Yes, yes, yes. 